Well, good morning, everybody. Last week, Lance walked us through the parable of the prodigal son in just a beautiful, masterful style. And if you haven't watched that message, I encourage you to go back, watch that uh, at some point this week. It was just outstanding. And his story of uh, flying a kite with his grandson and the two of them fighting the string has stuck with me all week this week. But that's not the whole story in this parable of the prodigal son, there's actually two sons that this father has. And this morning, we're going to look at the older son together. Here's the context for this parable. Jesus is well into his ministry. He is growing in popularity. He's teaching in a way that's different than any other of the religious leaders teach. He's also treating people differently. He is especially kind and generous to the poor and the marginalized in society. And everyone is welcomed into his conversations about God, God's love, and grace. And that, to be perfectly honest, irked some of the religious leaders. That's why we read this at the beginning of Luke chapter 15. Luke writes, by this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation. I love that. Some of the translations actually just are bold enough to say some notorious sinners were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. Now, the Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them. He treats them like their old friends. And Luke says their grumbling triggered this story. In fact, their grumbling triggered three stories from Jesus. And he hopes that by telling these three stories that he can give these religious leaders an attitude adjustment. So I just imagine Jesus telling these stories without ever leaving the table where he's enjoying this meal and his friends. 
He doesn't abandon these spiritual and social outcasts to deal with the people who are full of themselves and full of haughty religion in the back of the room. And after each one of these stories, he kind of checks the room to see if he's made his point with them. Story one, nope, he launches story two. After story two, no response. And so Luke says at that point, to further illustrate his point, Jesus tells the story of a father and two sons. Last week, Lance walked us through that. Just a quick review, the younger son comes to the father and asks for his inheritance before the father dies. Really out of character, really out of line for that son. And quite surprisingly, the father gives the money to the son. And so with his pockets full of cash and his mind full of wild dreams, the son leaves and goes away to a distant land, where, to the surprise of no one, he blows all of that money in a short amount of time. And pretty soon, he's in dire straits, and he realizes the seriousness of his situation, and he decides to go back home and plead with his father for forgiveness and just to live in his house as a servant. The father sees him coming, runs out to greet him, and before the son can say a word, throws his arms around his neck, kisses him, expresses his love and forgiveness, invites him into the house, and begins planning and throwing this massive celebration for his youngest son. Hugh, the older brother. While all this was going on, Luke says, the older son was out in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what's going on? And the servant said, hey, your brother is back. And your father has killed the fatted calf, and we are celebrating because of his safe return. And that is where the story starts to get really painful for the religious leaders. And if we're honest, it can get uncomfortable for us if we have any of the traits that this older brother is about to display. While the prodigal spent most of his time fighting the string, the older brother held on tight to the string and resented it the whole time. The anger, the jealousy, the judgmental attitude that were about to come out of this older son were in stark contrast to the celebration of grace and love that were happening inside the house just a few feet away. Oh 
So let's look closely at how this story of the older brother unfolds. Luke writes that when he gets the news about what's going on in the house, the party that's happening, he refuses to go in and he gets angry. Now, this whole idea of not going into the party was a huge insult to the father. We don't get that in our culture, but in Jesus' day, when a party was thrown in the house, it was the older son's responsibility to serve as the formal host for the party. He'd be the one who'd arrange all the food. He would arrange all the wine, and he would make sure that all the guests had plenty of both so that they had a really good time at the party. So when the older son stands outside and refuses to go into the party, that's actually more offensive to the father than the younger son leaving home. And yet, in spite of this offense, Luke says the father comes out and begins to beg his son to come in. It would have been perfectly within the father's rights to disown his son, to disgrace him publicly in front of all the guests, even to disinherit him on the spot for his behavior. And instead, the father goes out of his way to patiently plead with the son to not use any of his power or authority, but just beg him to come in and celebrate his brother. Now, I can just imagine, Luke doesn't give these details, but I just imagine that as this conversation goes on between the father and the older brother, that the volume goes up, that the tension goes up. And I kind of picture the party grinding to a halt. The band stops playing, the people stop talking, and everybody in the house is trying really hard not to, but they can't help but listen to this angry conversation. The embarrassed father's pleading with his firstborn, and that's when his true heart begins to come out. Here's what the older son says. He says, look, all these years I've slaved for you, and you never once refused, I never once refused to do a single thing that you asked me to do. And in all that time, you never even gave me so much as a young goat for a feast with my friends. And yet when this son of yours comes home, after squandering all your money with prostitutes, you celebrate and kill the fatted calf. This older brother's self-righteousness is fueled by his resentment. I can't imagine how many conversations they would have had over dinner while the younger son was away, while the father grieved over the loss of his younger son, while the father worried about the life and the health of his younger son. I can't imagine the extra work that the older brother picked up because the younger brother had abandoned them. Whatever fueled his resentment that day, it couldn't be contained any longer. He didn't say, I've served you, Father, faithfully all these years. He didn't say, I've worked alongside you, Father, all these years. He didn't even say, I stayed home and took care of you all these years. He used the harshest language available to him. He said, I have been your slave, doulos in the Greek. He said, I have been coerced into a job that I never wanted, and I can't quit. And on top of that resentment, he begins to claim a moral superiority over his brother, which is really ironic. He says, God, Father, I've never disobeyed you. And what's ironic about that is that while he's, claim, is that he's claiming the moral high ground, while he's embarrassing and humiliating his father and refusing to do what his father has asked him to do, he, he asserts his absolute perfection while his imperfections were most prominently displayed. It's painfully obvious that the older brother understands conformity, but he doesn't understand loving obedience. He follows the rules, but inside he's eaten up with bitterness and jealousy and pride, and in many ways he is further from his father than his brother who went a thousand miles away. 
Look at his accusation. Look at the language that he uses in it. He says, this son of yours. He divorces himself from any relationship to his brother. He says, this son of yours has come back after squandering your money with prostitutes. He's using outsider language. He's judging his brother from a distance. And it's pretty clear that he feels no obligation to help him and no compassion towards him. And then he just starts throwing shade. He says, look, he's wasted your money with prostitutes. That just came out of his head. That was an exaggeration, like all of us tend to do when we get angry. He's escalating. He's smearing. He tries to draw the gap between his obedience and his brother's rebellion. In reality, the problem is he's just jealous. And the father's words are priceless at that point. He looks at his oldest son and he says to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything, everything I own is yours. But we had to celebrate today. It was the right thing to do. Because this brother of yours that we thought was dead is actually alive. And this son who was lost has been found. I love the father's heart, don't you? See, his two sons are as different as night and day. They are unique in their decisions. They are unique in their temperament. One was a rebel. One was a rule keeper. But they were more alike than either of them knew. You get right down to the heart of it. They both wanted their father's stuff and they'd missed out on a relationship with their father. They both used their father to get what they loved in life. They were both alienated from their father. They both needed their father's grace and forgiveness. I just find it fascinating in this story that the difference between the rebel and the rule keeper is seldom as great as the rule keeper would like to believe. Now, maybe you're like me. Whenever I read this parable, I wonder. I actually just sit and think about for a while, which one of these two sons am I more like right now? It's a good question for us to wrestle with this morning. It's actually a good question to carry with you all week this week. Which one of these sons are you most like? See, I I think almost everyone instantly identifies with the younger brother. And though we might not want to wear the label notorious sinner, we recognize our need for the Father's love and grace in response to our wandering ways. But I rarely encounter people who immediately own up to the idea of being like the older brother. We don't want to believe that we're like him. We don't want to believe that we're like the pious religious leaders that the story pointed to. Very few people recognize, have the self-awareness to understand their own sense of entitlement, their own sense of arrogance, even when it comes out in small ways. And those small ways matter. I'm told that airline pilots in their training learn what's called the one degree rule. Any tiny error in direction Even one degree off course can have a major impact on your final destination. If you're flying one degree off and you fly one mile in distance, that one degree will put you off course by 90 feet. Now, I'm hoping that if I'm in an airplane and it's 90 feet off course, we can still find our way to the ground, okay? But what happens if we stretch that out? What happens if we try to chart a course from Chicago to Los Angeles? If we're one degree off on that journey, we'll end up 50 miles off course. The story of the older brother is for me a case study in this one degree rule. See, he did all the right things. He followed all the rules. But resentment and self-righteousness filled his heart. And it didn't start as like a 90 degree rebellion. It seldom does for us. I'm sure his attitude, his 
bad attitude was really hard to detect early on because it's just like one degree off. But the cumulative effect eventually bubbled to the surface and it billowed out of him in anger and self-righteousness and tragically in his ability to understand and accept the Father's love. For years, I treated my relationship with God just like the older brother. In fact, I kind of viewed my relationship with God as a contract. See, God and I both have our sides to the agreement. Mine, I'm not going to do the things I'm not supposed to do. I'm not going to sin. And I am going to do the things I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do good. And if I keep up that part of agreement, then God's part is to give me a reasonably good life and to answer my prayers and to take me to heaven when I die. See, the problem is when we live our life, our relationship with God like a contractual agreement, it's really tough to figure out where we are in that mix. How good is good enough? And how bad is too bad? And what kind of relationship is that? It's just based in fear, not in grace. And it took a conversation with an older guy. I look back now, and he was about my age, so he's really young. Um, But my attitude towards God was changed by a conversation with that one man who helped me understand Grace. The older brother believed that because he simply followed the rules, he deserved a blessing. And so when he didn't get what he deserved for his faithful service, he got mad. The father had broken the contract. All these years I have slaved for you, and you never. It's easy to slip into that mindset. It's easy for it to creep into our behavior patterns. And so I want to challenge us all this morning to dig deep, to ask ourselves some really tough questions. Search your heart. Dare to ask honestly, do I have a relationship or a contract with God? Where in my life am I treating God and the people around me like that older brother? acted? Where's my heart off from what God desires in my life? Even if it's just one degree, how does that show up in my relationships, in my conversations, in my emails and tweets and texts and social media? See, I think it matters because Jesus is describing here a very real human condition. He is describing our hearts, our attitudes. In fact, he's describing the ones that the Pharisees had drifted into. And maybe you have too. The impact of that one degree of difference shows up most often when life doesn't go as we expect. (laughs) And we've certainly had a lot of that over the last 22 weeks. Not much goes like we expect right now. That one degree of difference between what God expects and where we are shows up when our prayers don't get answered, when our marriage, when our family, when our work falls apart. When that happens, if we're not careful, the heart of the older brother brother will bubble up to the surface. So let's just be honest with ourselves. Where are our thoughts Where are our words or our actions being judgmental, being ungrateful? Where am I withholding grace? Because the changes we would make today, even a one-degree course correction, can chart a completely different future for our life five years, ten years down the road. I love this parable. It is beautiful because it says to notorious sinners, to the younger brothers in this world, that God's grace is a celebration that you're invited to. I love this because it says to the older brothers that you are emphatically accepted by God 
in the same breath as the notorious sinners. Gratefully, God's grace comes to us, whether we're fighting or resenting the strength. The Anglican priest, Robert Capon, beautifully summarizes this parable, and I want to just close with this. He says, you know, that he believes that grace is a celebration of life, relentlessly hounding all the non-celebrants in the world. It is this floating cosmic, cosmic bash shouting its way through the streets of the universe, pounding at every door in a hilarity beyond all liking until the prodigals come out and dance and the older brothers take their fingers out of their ears. I love that. Would you pray with me, please? God, we are at some points similar to this older brother. If we're honest, we can see aspects of ourselves that are like him, and we don't want to be that way. So God, please fill our hearts afresh with your joy. Crowd out our complaining, our self-righteousness. And give us a compassion for the younger brothers who long to come home. God, forgive us when we complain and whine, I pray. And make us children who live in your joy and mirror your grace and your heart of mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh brother, oh brother, where have you been? I just closed my eyes and then you walked in. Well, there's mud on your face and there's blood on your hands. I've been searching for you since I don't know when. You grew up fast and you grew up tall. I spent all my time looking at you through that wall. You chose your path, and I chose mine too. Well, this week I came across a quote from Francis de Sales, and he is describing the discipline of mindfulness. And he said, if you've gone astray, quietly bring your soul back to the presence of God. And I think that's what communion is exactly about. We just need to quiet our soul so we can be in the presence of God and just thank him for what his son did on the cross for us. So as you take your bread, let us remember his body that was broken for us.
And as we take our juice, let us remember the blood that was spilled for us. Let us drink together. Dear God, thank you so much that we can come to this place each and every week this quiet, simple space of communion. We can bear our souls to you, that you allow us to do that. Thank you so much, Lord. Lord, we pray for the kids going back to school this week, the teachers, the parents. There's a lot on people's plates. But thank you that we can just bring all that anxiety, all that worry, all that stress. We can bring it before you, Lord. Help us quiet our souls this week. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, because of your generosity, we were able to help a family that was going through a financial crisis. So we are just so grateful for your generous hearts. And that's why we believe offering is a reflection of our gratitude in our lives. So if you're willing to give, you can do so right now online or at the text number below. One thing you, if you could do for me is we have our Westridge app. We've had it for a little while now. Something that would really help us as we communicate and try to inform you on a whole bunch of different things. On the top right-hand corner of that home screen, there's a little paper airplane. If you would just click on that, it's going to open up a notifications window and just allow those notifications. We would appreciate that. Um, with the Westridge app, again, you can access all of the past sermons and online services uh, notes, you version, and a whole bunch of different events. So thank you so much for doing that in advance. A couple events coming up. We have the Westridge Kids Drive-In that's happening up, uh, happening up. It's happening Friday, August 21st. It's in the Westridge parking lot, and we are going to showcase Trolls World Tour. I'm sure it's amazing. Um, also, if you know a sixth grader and they are kind of entering into that new season of their life, we're having a sixth grade bonfire out here on the Westridge lawn on uh, Wednesday, September 9th at 6.30. Jordan will give you all that information. His information is down below. And also, the Sunday morning watch party, it's happening in the Westridge Cafe. If you feel comfortable, it's socially distant, and we'd love for you to join us with that. Um, let's sing this last song together, and we hope you make this a beautiful week. Your song.